this. He was waiting on me. I want to say something. Earlier, I got on Twitter and I went off because I saw some different posts with some of the uh, people who work for publications like New York Times and, um, you know, LA Times, bitch, whoever, all, all these different motherfucking platforms and people feeling like they are more credible, you know, than people like me. First of all, I don't give a fuck who you work for. Don't be mad at me because you got to clock in and you go write some shit and nobody reads that shit. That doesn't have anything to do with me. Um, you not getting the attention that you so desire doesn't have a motherfucking thing to do with me. Okay. That doesn't have any, you, you take your qualm up with your God, bitch. That don't have nothing to do with me. They sitting up here trying to discredit people like me when we sitting in the courtroom and be sitting in front of they ass. We are all sitting in the same motherfucking room, taking the same note. Too incredible when we sitting up in here. Now, when I'm giving you my opinion, that's my motherfucking opinion. But when it comes to who's reliable, bitch, we are all sitting up here writing down what the fuck is going on. Y'all asses is sitting up taking notes like everybody else. And then y'all could go sit up and compare and see what the hell is going on. So all of this, this person ain't credible, that person ain't credible, and all that other bullshit is just that bullshit. And I don't give a fuck. It's a whole bunch of sick, just stupid, really envious ass people. That's number one. Number two, NBC had already hit me up to let me know that they were about to run a story where people from um, Megan's side, take that how you will, people like Tamika Mallory, you know, um, have given them statements talking about I'm spreading misinformation. Now, how many times has good been done? Did Tamika Mallory have something to say? Or do you only care when you have a vested interest in something? Tamika Mallory, aren't you the same person that showed up one day out of the whole goddamn time? Because I haven't seen you but the, since Megan came in. Uh, Kelsey is a black woman, correct? Has anybody ever seen Tamika Mallory stand up for Kelsey when she was being cyberbullied by friends of people like Megan Thee Stallion that she came and sat in the room for? Did y'all see that? Or, or did, did you blink like I blinked and did we miss it? Have you been present to hear the testimony? Or are you sitting on the sidelines getting fed something? And then y'all want to talk about bias. Doesn't Tamika Mallory, doesn't she have affiliations and ties to Rock Nation? So wouldn't you have a vested interest in supporting Megan Thee Stallion? Would that be true? So who the fuck do you think you be talking about when you acting like I'm biased about how I feel about whatever? You, you sound dumb. You really sound fucking stupid. You're affiliated with Rock Nation. You brought your ass up, though, with people from Rock Nation, didn't you? Weren't you sitting next to Desiree Perez? And you came in there when Megan came. You have been supportive of her. You feel like she got shot, and that is what you have maintained and gotten on your platforms, and that's what you have stood for, correct or incorrect? So you're talking to me for what? Oh, but you didn't talk to me. You had nothing to say to me. How many times did I walk past you? How many times did you look and shut the hell up? So at the end of the day, girl, I don't give a damn about you sitting up going to NBC or anybody else because you and whoever else feels a way that I'm getting a particular type of attention and you don't like it. See, what has happened is them, they, whoever the fuck, are upset that they're not the only ones able to sit up and relay information. That is what the issue is. So now that you have other people relaying information and other people listening and feeling the way about it and feeling moved and compelled to form an opinion that does not align with theirs, now they have a problem. Now, oh, well, let's go ahead and talk to NBC about, you know what I'm saying, her spread of misinformation. Let's go pull up some old ass tweets and talk about it and, and, and run an article. Yeah, run your article, mention my name, and help me get my verification check. Thank you. I don't give a fuck about what the fuck Tamika Mallory said. Girl, fuck you. Girl, the fuck? Now, anyway... Let's get to it. I'm on a limited, you know, um, clock, bitch. We, we got a short amount of time. So we about to get into it and I'm going to tell you some more shit. And if you want to get your news somewhere else, then take your ass up the, ro the road and go get it somewhere else. If you want to go to Nancy Dillon or James Quilly or whoever the fuck you want to go to. And, and, and the craziest part is I'm sitting right next to James Quilly as we sitting up in the courtroom and he leaves the courtroom and you call yourself trying to shave me, nigga. That's what you called yourself trying to do because you got called out. Is that what happened? Sit there like you was and shut the fuck up some more. And take your little notes and go on about your motherfucking business, nigga. What the fuck do these people be talking about? Nothing. Anyway, let's get into some more shit. 
Day five in purgatory. So we come in at 10 30 a.m. The jury, um, first of all, they weren't in there yet. So the courts were like, look, the jury needs to know and understand Kelsey's immunity deal. Cause we just personally do not feel like she, the, the jury got a full understanding of what the hell going on and what she agreed to and all this shit so that they can properly assess the situation. And so the judge agreed with Tory people and he just told them, look, submit the goddamn uh, paperwork. And then there was an issue about, you know, um, evidence that they had that they just felt like, look, y'all not following protocol. So that's like, what do you want us to do? The judge is like, what you want me to do? So he was like, eventually, because they went back and forth about that for a little while. We just gonna have to figure it out. And we gonna, um, you know, what I'm saying he, he told them, y'all write something up and give it to me. And, you know, tell me how you feel and da, 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 da. Somebody just said something very important. Bitch, all y'all hoes is biased. If you formed an opinion. Okay. If you have formed an opinion, bitch, you're biased. If your opinion is not, I'm neutral, you're biased. If you have chosen a side, you're biased. If you're going to sit up and say, I feel like this happened. I feel like this person innocent and that person guilty, bitch, you're biased. So why the fuck I'm supposed to care about you feeling like I'm biased? You want everybody to down that nigga. Y'all y'all don't like the fact that a bitch from Houston is supporting that nigga. And I am. And I don't give a fuck. And what the fuck you gonna do about it? Nothing but be mad. Go give another motherfucking statement to another outlet, bitch. That'll make three. I'll get my check. Moving along. So anyway. um, They said that they um might bring Stogner in. Was they trying to get him for Monday? And so... Child... They said there's a re there was a request for Prince. And then they were, they were talking about the weapon and the magazine and no DNA. They talked about um, the medical records. And what was said was, and this, this was said by Tory people, the medical records are irrelevant. Because at the end of the day, this ain't a case about who shot who. I mean, I'm sorry, this ain't a case about did she get shot. It was a case about who shot who. And I agree. Like, y'all coming up in here with all this other bullshit and talking about, well, okay, let's look at this and let's look at the medical records. The only thing we need to be talking about is who shot her. You know, that's, that's the core focus. We can get into that, but the actual focus is who shot her. And that was just spending too much motherfucking time on that other bullshit. And so they talked about issues with Stogner's credibility because word on the street is he was boop, boop, boop. Hitting people, he ain't had no damn business, so he don't have a job. And so they said that there was a lack of DNA in this case. And so they said, listen, put it in writing. I'll go over it. We'll reach some type of conclusion. We have to move on. And so we finally get into the witness. The witness that came in first was an investigator, a senior investigator named Jody Little. And so they said, you know, did you meet? And let me tell you something about Jody Little really, really quickly. She reminded me of Tabitha Brown. Um, black woman that came in, uh, she had the cutest little walk and, um, she just had a, a sunny disposition and was really smiling and had one of them really like super cute voices. Like she just seemed really, really, really sweet. And so, um, she, she was cute for what it was. And so she came in and, um, they said, did you meet with Kelsey on the 14th of September in 2022? And she said, yeah, they said, where well, you uh, had the interview at. And she said, it took place at my job, you know, um, in the courts on the ninth floor. They said who was there. So they went over who was there, you know, by um, Kathy Ty, Kelsey, her husband. Um, they had, you know, some of her representatives on the phone, representation on the phone, rather. And so um, they said, how long did the interview take? They was like, it was from 1130 to 1258. They said, how was Kelsey when you met her? They said, the first time I met her, you know, she was comfy, friendly, cordial, you know, all of that. They said, did she seem threatened? There was an objection. They said, what was her husband's demeanor? They said, professional, supportive, and everything else. So now they queue up the interview. Um, they told the court reporter that she didn't have to take no notes on this shit, okay? They hand out transcripts to the people, you know, um, in the jury. All right, let's get into what Kelsey said. And I... You want me to show you my notes for what Kelsey said? They say I'm unreliable. They say I'm unreliable. Bitch, I'm in there writing in that motherfucker like it ain't no tomorrow. They said I'm unreliable. Nah, bitch, I'm getting to the business. I know exactly what the fuck was said. So let's talk about it. Kelsey says, and I'm going to say this as Kelsey is saying it. 
Okay. Kelsey said that she met Megan in college at PV. That is better known as Prairie View. Okay. We call it PV down in Houston. Um, because obviously Prairie View, duh. All right. She said she had known Megan about six or seven years. She said we were friends and as she grew, you know, um, in her business with music, I became her assistant. And she said, maybe I became her assistant around late 2018, early 2019. So the, till the incident happened because after that she lost her job. They said we were in LA at the time that everything happened, um, to record the WAP video with Cardi B. She said, I had to leave and then come back because I had COVID. She said, we had relocated to LA after COVID. And uh, since COVID had affected schedules, they were supposed to go overseas, you know, to film some things, but they ended up, you know, staying in the States because they got canceled because of COVID. And so they stayed together, you know, every time there was something to do. If there was a hotel, then okay. If um, they were going to stay in the Airbnb, then okay. So we jumped to that particular night. She said on that particular night, um, Kylie uh, invited them over. And what particular night am I talking about? I'm talking about at the WAP video. Kelsey says that they were invited to um, Kylie's house for a get together at the WAP video. And so she said, I met Tori in early 2022 with Megan. So they met him at the same time at the Rock Nation brunch. Okay. <sighs> she said everything was okay. You know, we had fun. She said, I will flirt with Tori and Megan encouraged the relationship. Before Kelsey could get back, they had spent time together and all of that. She said, I got back less than a week before the shit, you know, popped off. That contradicts what Kelsey said when she was on the stand. Kelsey said that she had been back at least two weeks before anything happened. But okay. She said, Kylie invited us um, at the WAP video shit. And Megan asked, uh, um, she wanted me and EJ to come. So she said she got there and it was about 6 or 7 um, p.m. She said, once we got there, there were six people there. She said, Megan started making nachos and the rest of them played beer pong. And um, they said, can you name, you know, anybody else that was there? And she said, um, Kylie had her three besties. She said, somebody named Thigh, another guy and another bitch. That she'll, she'll know the name. And then she said, Corey, which is Chris's boyfriend. Odell Beckham and his friend. So she said, you know what? Matter of fact, it was probably about nine people. She said, we was playing beer pong and we played basketball. She said, Megan was in there cooking them damn nachos. Um, so that should have took about 10 goddamn minutes with that damn ground beef in that damn hotel. So she said, Megan came out and said, y'all having fun without me? And so that was like, join in. And so they got in the pool. And later in the night, she said, things began to go left. She said, I did, um, you know, need to go lay the fuck out. She said, I passed out. I was unconscious, child. I had to go lay down, lay down because I was drunk. She said, I went to bed probably at like 10 or 11. By the time she woke up, Tori was there and everybody else was gone. So it was just Kylie, Megan, EJ, and her and Tori. They said, um, Megan called Tori on FaceTime. Okay? They believe that that's how, you know, she believes that's how he got the invite. She said, when I looked, um, oh no, when I woke up, I was good. They said Kylie and Tori and Megan was in one area. Ky uh, Kelsey said I was in the hot tub. She said EJ was at the cabana. They said Megan was doing this laugh that was so weird and obnoxious that Kelsey felt like something was wrong. So she said Tori had called her, but she was like, bitch, I ignored it because I didn't want to have nothing to do with that shit. And so um, Tori was kind of going in between Kylie and Megan. She said EJ said, like, child, we got to go. So Kelsey went to go pack up their shit that was in the room that Kylie provided for them, you know, when they got there to change in and things of that nature. So um, EJ had already packed the bags, but Megan did not want to leave. OK, so she said me and EJ loaded the car with our suitcases and then we went back in to tell Megan, let's go. And Megan did not want to leave. Kelsey said that she sat in Tori's car with Quan in the front and she was on FaceTime with her sister and um EJ just said, Listen, baby, we have to go. Okay? And so they said, Baby, just tell her that her wig's slipping. So Kelsey went in and said, like, come on, you know, get out the pool because your your wig's slipping. And so she got out. And then Megan told EJ, Tori gonna take us home. So she said, um, Meg and I put our shit in Quan's car. Now that is something different. Because at no point in time had anybody told us that Megan had put the shit in the car. So now we got bitches that's then packed up back, a whole nother nigga 
packed up a bag in Kylie house. We don't know what the fuck was in them bags. And then they go put it in an EJ car. And then they go put it in fucking uh, Torah car. So we got a whole bunch of people moving a whole bunch of shit. And we don't know what the fuck in them damn bags. Bitch, it could have been 50, 11 motherfucking pistols in them bags, bitch. Stick talk shit. But y'all don't know what was in your bag, ho. So, um, okay. Megan told Corn, don't forget that Corn is the driver. Megan told Corn, go get Tori. When Tori caught wind of it, he came up, but he was like, take them home. And so Kelsey said he wasn't mad when he said to take us home. He just didn't want to leave with us. They said Tori stayed with Kylie while they left the home. Okay. Now they leave. Okay. Corn and them um, are in the car. Quan, Kelsey, and Megan on the car. Okay, as they were leaving, they said Megan was still laughing. Like, just this weird, obnoxious ass laugh. EJ left at the same time that they left at that point. And because he was going in a different direction, even though he left at the same time, there was no need for him to follow them. So, you know, he went on about his business. So, now EJ gone. Okay. She said Megan is in the car just laughing, like this super fucking obnoxious ass laugh, and she is not understanding, like, what the fuck is so funny. But Megan was in the front seat. It's early, early, early in the morning, like the middle of the night. So she was just like, I don't know what the fuck was so funny. So she in the back seat just doing her thing. Then Megan says, I left my slipper. I need to go back. So they say, Kelsey say, she demanded that Quan take her back to the house. So they said they pulled back up, and Kylie had six security guards. So they say Megan had um, called to check and make sure that it was okay that she came back in so that she could get, um, you know, her shit or get her shoe. She said she left a slipper. So they say that her and Quan went in, okay, while Kelsey sat in the car. They said um, Kylie comes out to the door entryway and Quan and Megan and Tori, you know, kind of rush out and come back to the car. She say Megan came up to the car and said, bitch, Kylie said we got to get the fuck out of here, Okay. And that when Quan got in the car, he said that Tori and Megan had an argument. Now, Kelsey said it wasn't an argument in Kylie's house. She didn't ever give a damn about Tori flirting with her. With her. Um, but now, and she ain't get kicked out by Kylie. Now, bitch, we got Kylie standing on the porch in the motherfucking doorway. I guess she was supposed to be somebody's rich ass mammy. And kicked them niggers out of her motherfucking house. Because they weren't about to have that over there. Okay. Next. So they said, so we leave and we driving and Megan is still laughing. So Kelsey said, I said, well, damn, bitch. I'm, I'm going to, you know, juice it up a little bit. But she said, damn, bitch, what's funny? And Tori said, yeah, Megan, tell your friend what's funny. Your best friend, how, uh, tell your best friend what's funny and tell her how fake your ass is. And then so he gonna make a plan dumb. Who you took you up? And so um, she told my Kelsey, don't listen to him. So, Tori started cussing her ass out. This is all Kelsey's recollection. She started um, cussing um, him out. And he started cussing her out. And so, Kelsey said, now look, I don't know what the fuck going on, but this is my friend, and you're not going to talk to her like that. So, she said they got into it. And then, that he allegedly told her, I'm from Canada, as to imply that he was a thug. Bitch, you do know that Canadian people are known for being like some of the nicest people, right? There was some, they said there ain't even no ghettos in Canada. Child, I don't know. But in the fucking way. Um, then Kelsey say that Tori said, my nigga, I'll shoot your ass. And reach to the middle console, but he ain't never grabbed nothing. Okay? And so he just motioned for it. And then Kelsey said, well, if it's my time to go, I'm, it's my time to go. I got people that's going to ride for me. And so the arguing continues. And then Megan demands that they pull over. They said Megan jumped out the car. And Tori got out the car right behind her, and they went and sat at the bus stop. Now, Megan played crazy. She never acknowledged that they left the first time to go back home or that all that shit, you know, was moved the way it was, and that she went back to Kylie's home. Uh-huh. Because she claimed that she had left the slipper. She said that was a lie. Oop. If we can prove that in any way, or if there's video footage, which I'm sure that Kylie has video footage and the bitch is coming back to the house and all that shit, that whole lie, bitch, that's proof. But any motherfucking way, um, she demanded that he pull over. Now, another contradiction is the fact that Megan said that when she got out the car, she walked over there by the bus stop, but she don't remember, like, nobody coming up and talking to her, you know, and shit like that. Kelsey said Tori got out right behind her and went to talk to her. She said when they got back in the car, everything was calm. And then when he got back in the car, 
Tori apologized to Kelsey and said, I'm sorry, man, because you a real nigga. My bad. They said Megan ain't like that. And then she starts with her bullshit again. Okay. They said that, um, child, they said she started that uncontrollable laughing shit. And then they started arguing about, you know, artistry. And she said, you only hot because of the feature with Jack Harlow. But she couldn't really remember nothing else or what he said back or nothing like that. So allegedly Tori told uh, Quan, the driver, get these bitches about my car. This is my motherfucking car. Let these hoes out. So they say Quan pulled over. She said, Megan jumps out and um, I open my door, you know, not paying attention. She said, I get out and then I hear gunshots going off. And at about the second or the third shot, I look up and I see Tori leaning over the, um, the door window and Megan's seat. And he's shooting over the top of the door. He must have jumped up the, you know, shooting the gun. And when they say jumped up the, like the front seat, um, he must have jumped up the, and then she said, my body is behind the door. So I'm out of the vehicle. They said Megan was walking away and then she turned and then saw us. She said at that point, I can only see her chest, but she looked like a damn headlights. They said Quan was quiet and I don't know where Tori pulled the gun from, but after the shot, she said we froze and then she kind of clicked back in. And some type of way, Megan gets to this driveway, she claims. She said, Tori sat in the damn front passenger seat. Kelsey said, I ran over to Megan to check on her. And I was in defense mode. So I never looked at any of her injuries. But when I grabbed her, I saw blood. And then I saw Tori come around the back of the vehicle. And I was afraid. And, you know, I was just in defense mode and, you know, didn't know what to do. So she said, you know what? I stepped up and got in between Megan and Tori. And then we fought. Okay, she said, um, and she said that that's when her and Tori got in the fight. She said, Quan got Kelsey and picked her up like a damn rag doll and said, Kelsey, they do this all the time. Spoiler alert, Quan has no motherfucking gunshot residue on him. None was found. So you mean to tell me that with the way that gunshot residue transfers and by the, the fact that you, Kelsey, had gunshot residue on your hands, you went over there to check on Megan, who was never tested for gunshot residue conveniently, and Quan came over there and lifted your ass up off the ground like a rag doll, and Quan had absolutely no gunshot residue on him. Is that what we're going with? Is that logical to you would be my question. If a nigga pick you up like a rag doll, what you going to do with your hands? You going to try to hold on to that nigga, right? So that nigga should have gunshot residue on him, huh? Yeah, all right. So any fucking way, he had none. So she said, um, Quan got Kelsey and said, child, they do this all the time. And so she said that I don't know if Tori slapped me, punched me. I don't know what, what the fuck he did. She said, but Tori was in the driveway with Megan. She said, Quan said, child, they do this all the time. Like, And then Kelsey said, huh? She's shot. She needs help. And she said, um, I jumped into the vehicle and I made it jerk to get them to notice. She said, I ain't, I ain't drive the car or do nothing or nothing like that. But that, um, you know, I, I jerked the car to make them notice. I don't know if she meant she used her body weight or what, but I don't know. She said, Tori, at that point, you know, uh, looked up and then came over there. She said that he pulled her by her hair. And then that's when she got afraid for her life because she said he was pulling her neck in such a way that he wasn't choking her, but the shit hurt. And then she said, Quan came to like try to pull her away from him, but it was like a tug of war because he was pulling on her. And then she said, I simply said, Tori, what are we doing? And all of a sudden, Tori just let her go. And that's all it took. He just let her go. Okay. They said, Kelsey said, and then I looked up and Megan was standing at the driver door. The one that came up? Never mind. So he said, get in. Okay. Um, and so they got in the car. She said, I lost my chain in my nail fight in Tory. She said, but at this point we changed seats. Megan um, was calm. Okay. She said, but I was having a panic attack. And so um, she starts to cry. On the audio, you can hear Kelsey crying. She said, Megan said, Kyle T. Ferris. And um, they were heading home, not to the hospital. But that Quan took another turn because it seemed like he was going to take him to the hospital. They say T. Ferris had bad signals. So she sent a text to Justin that said, you know, help 911. Tori shot Megan. They said they show, uh, I'm sorry, they showed Kelsey the text to corroborate it. And she said, yeah. She said she dropped her location to T. Ferris. 
She said, then she texted her mother and said, help. And Kelsey was breaking down again. She said that um, I was hurt physically, you know, but she said I didn't feel that yet because my adrenaline was so high. She said I was really emotionally hurt she, the most at the time. She said, so we're driving, and I also called a person that I was talking to at the time and kept the line open because I was just so nervous about what was going on in the car. So I just wanted him to be on the line so he could listen. So she called him, and they was talking, and um, he picked up, and he sat on the line. So she said Megan put her leg on her, but she still never saw the injury. And that Kelsey was in the car crying, so Kel that Tori told her, girl, shut the fuck up. So she said the cops, um, you know, kind of passed them a little bit, one cop car. So I guess maybe they thought they wasn't coming for them. But then the swarm of cops is behind them now and a damn helicopter. She said, that's when Tori said, please don't say a word about this. I just signed a deal. I'm about to sign a deal. And I give each of y'all a million motherfucking dollars when I get the deal. She said, Megan was very calm. They said, could she have been in shock? She said, oh, no, she was calm. They said she didn't seem upset with Tori. And so um, she said, the cops came and made them get out the car. And she said, please don't put your knee on my back like George Floyd. You know, and she said, people weren't really talking. Her adrenaline was running. Um, she said they, you know, taking Meg and, uh, she said, I regret not saying something about my injuries at the time. Cause I should have, she said, she was so focused on Megan. She didn't talk about it. She said, Ferris actually came to the scene as they were putting Megan in the ambulance, you know, and I guess, I don't know if he got in the ambulance with her enough with her, but he was on the scene. And remember she had sent the location. She said, I ended up being taken to the police station and they put me in a room, but I do not recall them swabbing me for gunshot residue. Whenever they did that, she wasn't aware. She said they asked if I wanted to uh, talk. And she said I asked for a lawyer because that's what I saw on TV and movies. That's all I knew to do. So she said when she got released, she got released at the same time as Quan the next morning. And that Quan said, um, shit, money talks. And so she said he also said Tor was trying to protect me. Um, and she said she just felt like people was playing mind games with her because, bitch, what? And so she said, Tori's friend said, I don't know why he said that when he picked up, or why he did that when he picked up Quan. And she, um, called security, Justin, and asked for a ride. Justin said, go ask her manager, Jilly. So they say Jilly came immediately, took her, to Kelsey to her apartment, changed clothes, and went to Megan. Okay. She said that she had to sit outside. She said, I'm in a car and waiting and I get a jail call, you know, and she said she had been answering the phone for a nigga in jail. So she thought it was him. So she went ahead and answered. She didn't know it was Tori. And so Tori calls. We already know what happened. He called and asked about the incident. I told you guys exactly what that phone call was about because they already played it for us. Um, she said, I didn't get to see or talk to Megan. She said, um, then I eventually got a text back. And I asked to see Megan, but nobody was answering me. She said, Desiree Perez said that Megan going to be down a whole year, maybe. And so Kelsey said, well, I'm considering going home. And then she said, um, you know, well, shit, if I need to go home, okay, because I need to seek treatment because I have all these different pains. And she said, so let me kind of get my shit together and I'll let you know. And she said, no sooner than I can send that message, they already had my flight booked. The flight was for the it was it was within the next two hours. Excuse me, I'm trying to rush because I gotta go. So the flight was for the next two hours, and um, Kelsey said, "You know, like what what the fuck am I supposed to do?" Like she confused, like y'all sending me home or like what? And so um, she says that Desiree told her, "L.A. is dangerous and the house isn't safe, so you need to go get a rental." She said, "Look, can you rebook my flight so I can get my shit together?" And she said, "She said okay." Um, she said a driver came, you know, and helped her. Tori called from Quan phone and then he whispered. I gave the pen to my hotel to get my shit. She gave them her location. So, um, child, that's what she felt like she wanted to do. She said, so he came and he asked me to come to a studio location, but she ain't feel safe doing that. So she said, no, she said, prior to me going to meet, I told my sister where I was just, you know, to let, let somebody know what was up. She said, Tori was in the driver's seat, but he wasn't driving nowhere. He was just in the seat. And then he was apologetic. 
And Kelsey said, let me hear him out because it was a wild night of drinking. So she said um, that he was sorry. And she said, I knew that he was so sorry. And he said, um, but Kelsey, she attacked my artistry. I told them, um, I told him that he was wrong. I told him, you know, this shit ain't okay. You need to apologize to her as well. She said, but at the time I didn't know that he had spoken to her because she ain't answered her. Then um, the team, she said, the team was treating me weird. So Kelsey said she sent a long ass text message. You know um, how you just get fed the fuck up and you send a whole three paragraphs? Yeah, that. So she said, Megan finally called her back and said, look, find a place and I'll, play, I'll pay for your rent for a year. And then she said, Megan told her, dog, I can't walk. And uh, that's when it was revealed to her that Megan had caught a red eye to New York. So she was like, damn, they shut me out? Like, what the fuck I do? I want to pause right quick. If Tory Lanez had purchased a property or paid the rent up for a year for Kelsey, that would have been called bribery. They were not seeing eye to eye. Kelsey and Megan were not seeing eye to eye. She was being shut out. It's a lot of, you know, different circumstances. And Megan, per her own admission, paid her rent up for a fucking year. If Tori had did that shit, it would have been called something. Yeah, and you already know what. Okay, let's go ahead and get into... Megan, why did you lie like you hadn't talked to Kelsey? You all on social media talking about, I ain't talked to them motherfuckers that y'all been asking about. You know, th them motherfuckers went to jail. But you knew damn well that you had talked to Kelsey a few times, we found out, if y'all want to believe this audio, that Kelsey told everybody that she lied about the day before. So anyway... Um, and then what else? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. And oh, this is my other question. If this was all Tory fault, what y'all start treating Kelsey like that for? Why was Kelsey iced out? And why did Kelsey lose her job if she didn't do anything? If Kelsey truly was a victim and everybody knew that, why the fuck did Kelsey lose her job? Why was she left outside of the hospital? Why was she excluded when Megan got flown out to New York? You know, why, why did all of that happen? Why was y'all trying to send her back on a flight two hours after what happened? That's interesting to me. Moving along. She told Kelsey, find her a place. I'll pay the fucking rent. Okay. Um. Now, don't forget that we in the car. Okay. She in the car and she said, sorry, came to her hotel. She said, Rock Nation, um, or Megan's team, rather, whatever you want to call them, shut her out. She said, Tori said that he was sorry. And he was saying, Kelsey, what can I do? Like, do you want to work for me? You got something you want me to invest in? Like, or what's one thing that you really want to do? And she said, Kelsey said, she was like, what? And then Tori said, like, come on, you know what I'm saying. Like, this, how, this is what my lawyer, Sean Holly, told. Like, this is how she told me to word it. Now, I want to pause real, 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 real quick. Megan Thee Stallion claimed that Tori told her, I'll give you a million dollars, don't say nothing, I'm on probation. That nigga ain't never been on probation. So why the fuck would he say that? Kelsey is sitting up here, sitting, uh, bitch, I was going to say it twice. Kelsey is sitting up here hollering by, oh, well, Tori said, y'all want to believe this shit so bad, that Sean Holly had advised him to say that? Baby, Kelsey went to get that shit the next day. You understand what I'm telling you? That means that was July 13th. Baby, Sean Holly wasn't representing Tori and he hadn't reached out to her. Did you know that before you said that? You must not have. You, you, must, you must not have known that when you made that statement. Tory had not sought out counsel because Tory wasn't even under the impression that he was going to be charged with anything. Babe, let's get back into the timeline. Megan didn't say that a crime had been committed against her until the 15th of July on Instagram. Tory went to jail because the gun was in the vehicle and they were trying to charge him with it. They did charge him with it. And so, you know, he went to jail that night. And he was let out. But he did not have representation from Sean Holly at that time. So can you explain to me what sense it would have made for him to just dry ass throw her motherfucking name up and say, oh, well, Sean Holly told me to word it this way. And I want to remind you that Kelsey said the day before that she fucking lied about this shit. But I, I need y'all to know, and let's do a fact check. Sean Holly wasn't his representation. The fuck do y'all be talking about? So anyway, um... So she said that things were offered to her over a period of time via phone calls and text messages or a text. Spoiler alert. They said, Kelsey, you said in your interview that uh, 
you know, they asking the fucking, I'm sorry. The woman on the stand because the woman that was the witness had to sit up there and just listen to the shit. So she was asked, she said, Kelsey said that she had a text from Tori asking her what she would like, basically trying to bribe her. And Kelsey said it was in her other phone. They said, was that ever, did that ever materialize? Basically, was that ever given to you? Did you ever see that? She said, no. They got every other goddamn text message, which you don't have no text message or Tori saying, you know, what you, what you need from me. Why well, ain't that quite fucking convenient? Sure. Anyway. And so Kelsey said, you know, I do have the text where he was saying stuff like that to me, but it's in my other phone. I'm a look. And so she said he tried to um, reach out to me up until charges was filed. And so she said that she told, um, no, she said Megan hit her up on the 15th and said, Kelsey, do you want me to include you in this statement? She said, yes, Megan, I want you to protect me because I'm being threatened. You know, people are threatening my mother and all of that shit. So I said, yeah, please protect me and mention me in your statement. Okay. She said, I'll talk to my lawyer, you know, about it. She said, before I knew anything, Megan posted the statement and left me completely out. They said, Megan made, Kelsey said, Megan made an Instagram post. And Kelsey read the Instagram post, you know, in the interview. She said, so when Megan posted that and the public turned on me, I made my own post. After I made my own post, Megan said, why did you say that? This ain't the way. So that's when we take a break. We come back about 1.30. We continue with the audio. She said, I don't know anything about, um, oh, she said, I don't know anything but the truth. And I'm upset that she never defended or protected me. She didn't know that I had met Tori to get my stuff. So she didn't have no reason to be mad at me, which is even more interesting. So why, what was the animosity about if she fucked the nigga that she was fucking? Didn't they help betray you? So why she got attitude? She said, we went back and forth via text messages. And um, she said, I've been publicly approached. Kelsey said she can't even go to the dollar store. She said somebody cornered her in the damn dollar store, child. And so um, what else? We went back and forth in the text messages and she said I was uh I've been publicly approached. She said so I I really be trying to stay in hiding even though he's the bad guy. She said Megan did a lot of damage to me off the motherfucking internet. She say Megan hit her up and said, "Kelsey, I need you to get on social media and say what happened to us." Okay? They said her manager told me that she wasn't going to press charges. And I need y'all to listen to this shit. Kelsey said Megan's manager said she wasn't going to press charges until Megan got mad that social media was calling her a fucking alcoholic. That's when she made that post to go on Instagram. Kelsey went to her lawyer. After consulting her lawyer, uh, they said, you're not about to say a motherfucking thing because she ain't had your back and we worried about you and what's going to happen with you. And so she said, no, I'm not going to say anything. So my lawyer said no to her demands. Kelsey said Megan demanded that I get online and, and defend her. Um, she said, I told Megan that we need to talk. And um, I told her that I talked to Tori. Once she said she told her about not going on social media for her. That's when Megan started coming at her crazy. And um, it said that, uh, how you gonna go, you know, online and say what you said and go see that nigga. And she just kind of started throwing that shit in her face. That's when Kelsey said, I knew that this wasn't genuine. And we stopped talking and she went online and made it seem like I took hush money. So I text her. Kelsey said, I text her and I said, why the fuck is you bashing me? You know, they were trying to make me break. That's what Kelsey said. They said she had her friend saying that I got my chain from hush money when I've been paid for that chain. And it commemorates the day that my father died. They said she obviously approved these messages. So that's when it was over. And she said, I wasn't interested in doing a damn thing. It had nothing to do with making fuck up. Once again, I'm adding a little bit of sauce to it, but basically, Kathy Ta said, um, she was telling you this, or are you telling us this to get back in Megan? She said, no, I just want to free myself from this. They said she makes songs about me. People be posting about me, you know, and people don't know what to feel about me, you know? Um, they said, then she accused Megan of calling around Houston and telling people that she took hush money and not to talk to her. Okay. Whew. Kelsey says she hit up her representation and said, can you ask Megan's people to fucking stop? Kelsey says that when her lawyer hit up Megan people and said, baby, can she please stop? They said, 
well, why won't you get online, you know, and say that, you know, what happened? Now, isn't that an interesting response? Kelsey said, this is Kelsey's words. Y'all want to go by Kelsey's words so bad, correct? Y'all want to take this and apply it? Okay. She said, Megan never holds herself accountable for shit. She said, we could have gone home that night, okay? But she got mad at me and said, you know, and tried to flip it on me. She said, she tried to tell me, child, because now we back at the party and the circumstances from that night. She said that Megan told her, child, he tried to stay with Kylie. She said, that's when I realized that she never would have left a slip at Kylie's house. She was just mad that he was with Kylie. Megan is so low down that she knew that she was fucking Tori. Knew that Kelsey didn't know, but knew that Kelsey had fucked her, fucked him. So she tells Kelsey, he over there with Kylie, bitch, trying to make her mad, trying to make her want to go back over there, when really she wanted to go back over there. That's what Kelsey said. So, um, yeah, they said she was mad that he was staying over there with Kylie. This wasn't about no fucking slipper. She said... Megan asked me to stop fucking with Tori because she may have to work with him in the future. But now I know that there were other reasons why she asked me to do that. So that would imply that she's so motherfucking low down that she went to her friend that she tried to hook up with the nigga and said, you know what? Mm, maybe y'all not fuck that nigga no more because I'm going to have to, you know, work with him. But really, she wanted that dick out to herself. So then what happened? Hold tight. So, um, hmm. <laughs> She said, it's better to say that Kelsey was a bit of best friend and uh, versus saying that Megan was mad about Tori and Kylie. She said, now I know um, I was pushed out, okay? Because she didn't tell the truth initially. She said, they ain't going to tell the truth under oath. Kathy said, the trial will take place and the public won't know what's going on here. So the case has to be handled in court. And then Kelsey said, my concern, you know, outside of this is my safety. And she said, we'll talk off the record about that. But, um, you know, this is almost done. We're in a home stretch and we want a resolution for everybody involved. Kelsey said, I'm just trying to move forward. You know, I don't think Megan knows, you know, I never didn't want to tell the truth, but she's making it hard for me. And we finally get done with the audio. <sighs> what I want to say at this point is this audio meant absolutely nothing to me. This audio would have been damning and it probably would have been a nail in the cop. I'm going to tell you the truth. This motherfucking, um, without evidence, because they ain't got none. This audio could have been the nail in the coffin had Kelsey corroborated it. I spoke to a lot of people, not the jury, of course, but a lot of people listening who sat there where we sat once we went out into the space. And they said, you know, this would have meant more to me if we had a credible witness. They said that this was something that they dismissed completely because Kelsey's not credible. And I agree. Kelsey told y'all she lied already. To me, this was a desperate act and an attempt to pull on people's heartstrings and their emotions. And because Kelsey did not cooperate, you know, well, let's play it. And hopefully y'all feel like that's true, even though she said that it was a lie. After Kelsey, you know, made herself an unreliable witness. I don't see what the fuck we had to listen to it for. But desperate times call for desperate measures. So Kathy Ty said to the woman on the stand, remember, they played the audio of Kelsey, but there's a black woman on the stand. Her name is uh, Jody Little. And so um, they said, you know, Miss Jody Little, is this an accurate depiction of the situation? And she said, yeah. They said, do you think she was genuine? They said, yeah. Now it's time for the cross-examination. <sighs> I'm going to call him Mr. Um, Mr. McDonald's because I don't know how to pronounce that man motherfucking name. Tori, uh, it's her name. I don't, bitch, I don't know. Modesto, Modesto, bitch. Uh, I don't fucking know. We're going to call him Mr. McDonald's, okay? So under cross-examination, he said, um, do you know Detective Stogner? The woman said no. They said, um, you're involved in many cases, right? And you're involved with many cases. She said, yeah. They said, is there um, an investigating officer always present? And she said, in my unit, criminally, typically, yeah. They said, does a police officer usually um, lead? You know, and she said, yes. They said, was a police officer there? She said, no. She said, um, was Kelsey ordered to court? They said, yeah. They said, are you aware that Kelsey interviewed after being ordered to court? She said, no. They said, is there a recording or do you know um, who served her and what they said to her when they served her? They said, no. They said, is there a recording of that? She said, no. 
They said witnesses who are potential suspects, um, do they sometimes lie? Okay. She said, yeah. They said, have you dealt, you know, with liars and people that's then lied to you who are being accused of a crime? She said, yeah. They said, you in an interview, right? She said, yeah. They said, did Kelsey show you text messages? She said, yeah. And then um, they said, what about alleged text messages with uh, Tori? She said she had text messages with Tori, right? She said, yeah. They said, do you have any messages? Did she ever produce any of these messages with they saw Peterson? She said, no. So Kelsey claimed that Tori bribed her and she had text messages. The bitch, we ain't seen them hoes yet. All right, it's December. They said, um, was Kelsey given immunity at that interview, you know, at that point? And she said, I don't know. They said, what about prior to the recording? And she don't fucking know. So that was done with her. We pull up a new witness. This motherfucking witness, bitch. I'm going to have to call y'all back and tell y'all about it. I'll tell y'all when I get to where I'm going. This motherfucking witness that they pulled up next was the nigga that answered the phone when you say press one for English. They didn't got the nigga from Verizon Wireless to come get up on this goddamn stand to tell us what's going on. His name. Bitch, I don't know what the fuck his name was. He got so many letters up in his goddamn name, child. I think it's a spell. I don't know what the hell going on. But he is a firearms examiner. He didn't came up here with um bitch cartridges and models of the cartridge and all kind of shit. You know, trying to explain this shit to us. Now, I'm going to read you. I'm going to give you five more minutes. So, he shows the cartridge casing and ex and explains, you know, the difference between weapons and shit like that. What was substantial about this? He said in a semi-automatic, like in this case, you got to hit the trigger over and over again. So, they said, did you examine the firearm in this case? He said, yeah. And so, um, they said, what kind of gun was it? And he said, a 9 millimeter semi-automatic. And so he said the serial number on that hoe, he read it out. So, bitch, I wrote it down. The serial number was 684605. And so my whole thing is, y'all gonna trace this motherfucking gun? Who initially got this gun? I want to know who signed for this gun, who got this gun. The, the serial number, one more time. You listen, you got a pen? 684605. So I want to know who. I want to know the last person associated with this motherfucking gun. He said the gun was in working condition. They said, um, what's the chance that the gun will accidentally go off five times? He said it ain't going off uh, five times because it take 8.5 uh, accidentally because it take 8.5 pounds of pressure. Well, bitch, I looked up and I thought that little murder was going to be the next witness. And I wanted to stand up and I wanted to object because little murder said that it takes 7.5 pounds of pressure. Now, these are different weapons. So I don't know. But they said 8.5. So is he reliable? Because I believe LaMurda more than I believe him. So any motherfucking way, he said 8.5 pounds of pressure. LaMurda did not take the motherfucking stand. And, um, you know, we had to send Clifford home. So they said, you need to use effort to pull the trigger on this weapon. Um, You got to... Y'all know how pistol work, bitch. He say... This ain't the one that you can click, you know, hit that hoe, and that hoe gonna keep on going off. He said, you gotta hit that hoe, you gotta, you know, have some authority, and you gotta, you know, press that bitch, you gotta shoot it every motherfucking time, okay? All right, so, he said, I cannot call this an accident. They said, do you have to slide, you know what I'm saying, the shit back, the slide lock shit, do you have to release it before you fire? And he said, yeah, it's like, the slide lock is like a safety, they say, does the temperature of the gun change when it's fired? He said, shit, yeah, but I don't really know how much. They said nothing further. Cross-examination time. They say, you talked about bullet casings. Do you know uh, which way the casings went? Okay. And he said, with this gun, I would deduce that the shell casings went to the right of the gun. But the, the expert made it very clear that the shit can go all kind of different ways. You know, you, you can't necessarily... You know, for a hundred percent fact, you know, say that it won't go this way, that way. Up, it depends on how you point the gun. It it depends. It, there are a lot of different factors that go into where the shell casings go. All right, the defense pulled up a picture of where the shell casings were located per this investigation. Per this investigation, y'all can't see the picture. 
The four shell casings was in a nigga yard. Now, when you stop a car, don't you stop it in the street? Yes. We know for a fact that Quan didn't pull the car into the driveway. So let me tell you something. If Tori had shot that gun over a window, it wouldn't be over in that nigga's driveway. It, the, but them shell cases wouldn't have been there, baby. So the man had to acknowledge that more than likely the gun was fired in that general area because four of the bullet cases were in that general area. And they said, do you see this balcony right up here? And he said, yeah, I can see it. He said, if somebody was standing right there, um, do you feel like they could see what the hell was going on? Child, yeah. So they said, if you're looking for casings, can you tell me where the gun was fired? He said, the pattern ain't really reliable, but it would eject near the firing. And so they said it was four in the same area. So could that be the spot, you know, that they were shot? And he was like, um, you know, it's really not reliable. And so he was like, well, how many feet? You know, like how far could she go? He was like, it, it could go up to 18 feet away. He said the shell casings can go off like 18 feet away. And so he was like, and could this be an accident? And he was like, I'm telling you that it take 8.5 pounds of pressure to make that hell go off. And so he said, well, shit, don't kids be getting guns and firing them guns? He said, look, it's like eight pounds of pressure with this gun. He said, it's a double action gun. So um, he brought the shell case and picture up. And he said, did the shooting happen near this house? Now, this is what you need to get into. They asked the expert under cross-examination, did the shooting happen near this house? And he said, um, yeah. He said, you see that balcony? He said, is it fair to say that the shooting happened in this area? He said, yeah, like with 360 degrees. They said, have you seen fingerprints from the, the shell casings? And then, have you seen fingerprints from shell casings be lifted in cases before? He said, yes. He said, I've, I've heard of it, but I ain't, I ain't did it myself. But I do know that they sometimes have, like, you know, taking, you know, DNA from shell casings. Um, they said, have you ever seen how police retrieve prints? And he said, yeah. They said, why do you use gloves? They said, for contamination purposes, DNA, fingerprints, and all that shit. All right. They was done with his ass. They bring up Randy Zapata, a criminalist, okay? He works with DNA. Oh, I'm trying to hurry up. They said, did you obtain Taurus DNA? He said, yeah, I got a profile. They said, um, he said, I compared, you know, the handgun and the magazine, you know, to his DNA. He said, from the magazine, after I did, you know, research on it, I tested it, I have four contributors. He said, at least two were males. Get into these numbers. One person had 62% DNA on their hoe. And the second person had 26% then 9%, and then 3%, okay? Um, they said, did the person that held it the longest or maybe fooled with it the most, would they have a higher percentage? He said, no, not necessarily. They said, now, when it comes to the magazine, was Tory excluded as a contributor on the magazine from that gun? He said, yes. Tory Lanes was excluded. His DNA was nowhere to be found on the magazine. This is what you put into it once you load, load up and put them bullets, all right? So, let's get to the handgun itself. Not the magazine, but the handgun. They said there was one male's DNA on it, and the numbers go as follows, just like with the other situation with the 62, 26, 93. 90%, 5%, 3, and then 2. That ain't on a 100 scale. What the fuck is them numbers? I don't know. Anyway, they said that was inconclusive. They said Torah cannot be excluded or included because they, they couldn't prove that his DNA was on the gun. They said, is it common to see complex evidence in profile mixtures, which means that multiple people handle something? Um, they said all the test shows is that somebody touched it. So we checked the majority of the gun, you know, for those things. They said, okay, done. Cross-examination. They said the magazine had four contributors, right? He said, yes. Tori uh, was excluded from the magazine. He said, yeah. He said, if I load bullets, you know, into a gun, the DNA, my DNA would be on the, on the shit, right? He said, yeah. They say, if the gun was used frequently, your DNA would be on it, huh? He said, yeah. He said, in this case, it was DNA on the casings. He said, we ain't look at that. They say, if the gun is my gun and I hold it, load it, and shoot that bitch five times, do you feel like my DNA going to be on it? He said, yeah, more than likely. So they said, you have zero evidence for my client's DNA on the magazine. He said, yeah. He said, is my client excluded from the gun? Could you say that my client had that gun? 
He said, can you say that my client touched that gun? He said, no, no. And they told me to go to rehab. I said, no, no, no. Kelsey said, Tori woke up and said, hey, big ass. She said he whispered it. Girl. Redirect. They said, do you, um, no, they came back in and they was talking to the man. And he said, look, ultimately, I just do the damn report. And so he said, it, look, is there any evidence that my client touched the magazine or the damn gun? He said, no. Now, this is the get you gotcha. Chop. They said, do y'all have any samples for Kelsey? Do y'all have any DNA samples for Kelsey that were tested up against this weapon? No. He said, did y'all request DNA from Kelsey to test it on this weapon? They said no. So let me get this correct. Y'all don't know what the fuck that happened out there, but y'all know a gun was fired. But y'all put all y'all eggs in Tory basket and wanted to accuse him immediately. So much so that the LAPD with more sloppy ass work decided, hmm, let's go ahead and test Tory for gunshot residue and DNA. And we're going to test Kelsey for gunshot residue. Did y'all think that maybe she wouldn't have it? And then fucked around and found out it was on her hands? And nobody ever tested nor requested that she get, you know, DNA checked or swabbed so that they can compare it against the gun. Does that make sense to you? Is that logical to you? Does that sound like, you know, any type of police department that's trying to seek the truth? Because what they're supposed to be doing is investigating. This all happened today, nigga. So I'm just trying to understand how this was ever balanced. I'm trying to understand why nobody's having a conversation about how the LAPD has cut corners consistently. And every time y'all cut a corner, it was to make Megan's case stronger. But let me continue on. I can give you five more minutes and that's it. And then we have to go over that other shit. Um, mm, we come back at 340. Okay, we had a little break. They pull up somebody for the uh, the defense because they scheduled. They took him out of order because the prosecution has not rested, even though they need to take a long slumber. Oh, Instagram giving me a timer today. Oh, thank you, bitch. So anyway, let me get to the get you gotcha. I got one minute and forty nine seconds. All right. This man was a forensic scientist, a forensic scientist that talked absolutely too fucking much. He put me to sleep a couple of times, but I, I was listening up. But he, you can tell that he loves what he does. And this man um, is really a pioneer in terms of DNA. I was actually taken aback and uh, really on some like brain shit. Like nigga, you a cold piece. Like this nigga is one of the people that helped to create the way that we analyze DNA today. When it comes to that being tested and used in cases. So that is monumental. Like that nigga didn't get a Pulitzer Prize or some shit. I don't know. That shit crazy. But anyway, we got one minute in the nine seconds. They said, um, based on the DNA analysis that what can you tell us about it? You know, based on what they did, they said that they, um, did the DNA testing on the gun and, and Megan, I mean, on the gun and the magazine, I apologize. They said, can you explain, um, what the LAPD concluded from the handgun? He said that they said that they had DNA from four people and that one was a male, 45 seconds. They said, so at least one male was there. He said, yeah. And he said, but there was female DNA on the motherfucking gun. Listen, listen, let me, let me bend this page so I know where I'm at. I'm going to come back and tell y'all some more shit and get into it. But to me. That's some of the most important shit right there. That a female's DNA was absolutely on that fucking weapon. And I'm going to come back in like a few minutes and we'll wrap this shit up. But, um, oh, bitch, 